Hello, brothers and sisters, Pastor Danny here, and I want to say happy Epiphany. Uh, this is Epiphany Day, January 6th, uh, in the church calendar, and this year, as I uh, began on New Year's Day, or the Circumcision of Christ, uh, we'll be going through the various festival days, the various high points of the church calendar with you. Uh, one of the things that we see in that is just how Christ-centered uh, the Christian year really is. So I'd like to meditate with you upon the Word of God this day uh, and pray with you, so let's pray. O God, who by the leading of a star manifested your only begotten Son to the Gentiles, mercifully grant that we, who know you by faith, may after this life have the fruition of your glorious Godhead through Jesus Christ our Lord and all of God's people say, Amen. Our first Bible reading today is from the New Testament, the Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from the Gospel. If you have a Bible, you can turn backwards in it. From Ephesians to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw, we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. Behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going to the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The meaning of the Feast of Epiphany is given in its subtitle, quote, The Manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. In this season of the year, we move from Christmas, 
when the Son of God was born at, uh, as Israel's Messiah, to his being also the desire of all nations. So we move from Christmas to Epiphany, the revelation of the Son of God in human flesh, and now his revelation to the world, the Gentiles. Matthew so famously chronicles Epiphany in the journey of the pilgrims. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, verse 1. Uh, they are called Magoi, which, uh, from which we get the title Magi. Uh, this can be used of wise men, astrologers, even magicians. They're from the east, so they could have been from Babylon or even further from Persia, modern-day Iraq and Iran, where there were Jewish settlements after the various deportations back uh, in uh, the ancient times, 700 years plus before Jesus. The details of who they were aren't as important as whom they represent. They are the first fruits of the Gentiles to worship the Lord. As we prayed, by the leading of a star, you manifested your only begotten Son to the Gentiles. The psalmist sang of Epiphany, May the kings of Tarshish and the coastlands render him tribute, May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. Psalm 72. The prophet proclaimed Epiphany. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. They shall bring gold and frankincense. Isaiah 60. The details of who the Magi were aren't as important as whom they worshipped. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. Verse 2. Why would Eastern people worship a Jewish child? This star testified of who this child was. The Magi saw something that could be described and observed as a star. But make no mistake about it, this was a supernatural phenomenon. Note in the text how the star moved from east to west so that the Magi could follow it. The star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place the child was, verse 9. Further, it's implied that it shone both in night and day as the Magi followed it, almost like it was something like a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud from the Exodus story. Even more, note how the star is personified, or it's given personality in personal terms. It went. It went as if it were a pilgrim too, a traveler too. It went before them and it came to rest. And look at where it came to rest. Our ESV, as I read from the ESV, says over the place where the child was, which creates in us that mental image we've all seen in art, a star suspended in the sky with its light pointing down over this house. The text simply says, though, over where the child was. It hovered not over the house. It hovered over the child. What does all this mean? Hundreds of years before, Ezekiel in chapter 10 of his prophecy said the cloud of the Lord's glory lifted up from the ancient temple, from the Holy of Holies, and it went east with the exiled Israelites, and it never returned. Now Matthew says, that very glory is going from exile in the east to the promised land in the west again. To go east in scripture is to go east of Eden, as Genesis tells us in chapter 3, away from the presence of the Lord. To go west is to go back towards his presence in Eden. The glory of the Lord is leading Gentiles into the presence of the Lord's glory that rests above Jesus. The star is the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah from the Old Testament. This means Jesus 
the child whom the Magi worshipped is the Lord of glory, who once dwelt in the Holy of Holies, and who once dwelt in Eden. This is why when the Magi saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly, exceedingly with great joy and fell down and worshipped him, offering him gold, frankincense, myrrh as gifts. Paul so powerfully explains Epiphany in the gospel he proclaimed. God gave him for the benefit of the Gentiles, as he describes it, the stewardship of God's grace, and the mystery that was made known to me by revelation. A mystery can be a complete secret. It can also be a thing that once was hidden, but is now made known. The mystery of Christ was hidden in the Old Testament, but is now made known in this time of the New Covenant, after the coming of the Messiah, the Son of God in human flesh. This mystery was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets, uh, by the prophets, uh, uh, holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, excuse me. Paul's not saying this mystery was a complete secret before in the Old Testament, but when he says, as it has now been revealed, he implies that it's clearer now than it was before. What's clearer? Verse six, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, this gospel that the apostle was sent to preach. Before the coming of the Messiah, there were prophecies of this very thing, of the Gentiles being fellow heirs, of the Gentiles being members of the same body, of the Gentiles being partakers of the promise of, of the Messiah. We read this, for example, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, Genesis chapter 12. In you, Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There were examples of this in glimpses and even foretastes where Gentiles partook of these promises and people like Ruth, Rahab, the revival amongst the Ninevites. But now it's clear that this is God's purpose for the world. In fact, Paul calls this inclusion of the Gentiles the gospel itself. Verse 7. This is the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul wasn't merely a steward of this treasure, and he wasn't to steward it away in a vault, guarding it, protecting it. No. As he says here, uh, his, his very purpose was to bring this to light for everyone, Jews and Gentiles. Those ancient Israelites with all of God's promise and men like the Magi. The gospel of including the world was the plan, the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. It's so revolutionary to human thinking that it, it even has a heavenly dimension. Verse 10, through the church of Jews and Gentiles, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. In other words, the resurrected Jesus is the Lord of every tribe, language, people, and nation, not Satan, not his minions. All this was according to the eternal purpose that he has now realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's in him, it's in Jesus, that you and I have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Jesus. What a manifestation of the eternal Son in human flesh. He manifested himself in our space and time and humanity for everyone, for you, for me, for Jew, for Gentile. Do you know this gospel? Are you desirous to see it applied practically in your life, in your church family's life, in our national turmoil? that we constantly face. We who know this wise and gracious God, now by faith, are to pray for the people and peoples around us to come to faith too. And as we, who know him now by faith, as we pray, we ask him that we, Jew and Gentile, 
slave and free, male and female, rich and poor, black and white, and everything in between. We ask that we may, after this life, have the fruition, the full enjoyment of this God's glorious Godhead, to know him, to see him face to face. This is Epiphany. Let's pray. O God, who by the leading of a star manifested your only begotten Son to the Gentiles, mercifully grant that we, who know you now by faith, may after this life have the fruition of your glorious Godhead, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord go with you. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord sustain you this day. God bless.